So I want to welcome you both to uh, the Advanced Art Book Club. I'm going to start sharing my screen so both of you can see. Okay. The I'm slides turn that my I have. off to save my bandwidth. Okay. Uh, does everybody see uh, the current slides for today? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, great. Awesome. So uh, welcome to the Advanced Art Book Club. Um, basically, and what I'm going to do is just some basic introductions today. Uh, you Both of you are pretty be up to date with how the book clubs are run. So most of the stuff might be a review. Uh, I'll also kind of talk through some of the pr um, preface stuff from the book as well, and then talk about like the first um, kind of introductory stuff. There's no real big meetings for today. So, um, or there's no real big reading for today. Next, we won't meet next week because of obviously the time change between the, the North Americas and Europe. There's just that kind of, you know, Europe obviously goes first and then the United States or the North America and so, we're going to have kind of a mix up there. So we're just going to skip it for next week. But then after that, we'll start getting into further into chapters one and chapters two um, and discussing that a little bit more. But first off, I want to welcome you both to the awesome. book club. Um, this is a companion. This is the companion material for Advanced R, which is the book that we'll be discussing. So if you're not familiar with this, both of you, um, this is the book that we'll be reading through. It's completely open source. It's free to use. It's free to access. You just have to access it at advancedr.hadley.nz. We are planning to go through this book chapter by chapter, and we'll talk about how that structure looks like here in a little bit. So with this, let's talk a little bit about how the book clubs, book club meetings will run. Uh, basically, most of you said you're already in a book club, so you're already probably familiar with most of this stuff. But each week we're going to meet. Uh, I'll ask for volunteers to present a chapter each week. And anytime that there's not a volunteer for the for that week is basically I will take on the responsibility for presenting and facilitating discussions and putting things together for that time. Basically, this is the best way to learn. Uh, this is probably this is going to be my fourth club that I facilitated. So I feel that I've learned a significant amount from all of the different groups of people in this. I've met a lot of very interesting people through this. I've met a lot of people across different industries, which has been great. And so this is just an awesome learning experience. And so this being my now my fifth book and my fifth facilitation, I think this is going to be another great opportunity. Most of the presentations are just going to be a review of the material. However, uh, I really want to get away from just like lecture based. I, I really kind of see if we can stay away from just strictly going line by line by the book demonstration is a great way to teach and so i think if you're going to take on that facilitator role i highly suggest not only presenting the material that's important but thinking a little bit further about how you might demonstrate things or how you might demo things the more that we can dig into code and how the code actually works the more we're going to learn rather than just talking about concepts so i think that's a really important thing to kind of highlight for these groups is if you're going to facilitate think about how you might like make them better so if you're interested in how to present, if you are interested in learning how to do that, uh, everything is going to be facilitated through the materials on Git or on GitHub. And so are both of you familiar with GitHub? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Great. Awesome. So I'm not, I'm not gonna, I might spend a little bit of time on it, but I'm not gonna dig too deep in it because there's just so many different flavors of how you can use Git and how you can interact with GitHub. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit, but there is specific instructions on the README uh, in the materials for how to present. You can read through this list to see how it works. And then it really relies on the use this package to facilitate all of this. Um, I don't really use the use this package to interact with Git or GitHub, but if you are somebody that's not as familiar or you're somebody who wants to stay in the R environment, the use this package has really uh, set up a bunch of workflows and different functions to facilitate workflows to help you work with Git and GitHub and to work with these materials. And I'll highlight some stuff to look at to, to help you out with this. But if you're interested in like the step-by-step -step of how to do it, it's in the readme file for those materials and just take a look at them. Oops, so I'm back here. Um, other thing that I wanna uh, highlight to somebody uh, and people that may be joining later on is that these presentations will be recorded. Um, they're gonna be available to the R4DS online learning community YouTube channel. So keep that in mind for two things. First off, that they are recorded. So just you know, make sure that uh, if you have any like proprietary uh, intellectual property stuff, 
make sure you don't share that because this is recorded. And it's not an issue if you do share, we do have the opportunity to edit that information out, but just be cognizant of that this information is, is recorded and it's shared on our YouTube channel. How and does so that, just, uh, yeah, go ahead. for a second, but how does that actually work if you, I've never had it happen, but I do remember somebody telling me this before, like, if you were thinking, hey, wait a minute, I mean, I, I never get a chance to review the videos like after they're made. So you just have to remember, wait, did I, oh, I shouldn't have shared that. Then you immediately reach out to John or something like that, or to you or. Yeah, so John Harmon, so many of you are probably familiar, John Harmon manages pretty much all the resources for this. And so basically the recordings get put into like a shared file, a shared Dropbox bucket or something. And John has access to that. And he's the one who, I think John reviews everything to just make sure that there's no like he big seems mistake. To. So, but I mean, if you had like issues with that, I mean, you could probably reach out to him and he can give you access to the okay. Dropbox bucket. But yeah, the best bet is to reach out to, to John about it. I, there's only maybe one time that I ever remember that anybody like accidentally shared a window that they weren't supposed to share. And we just like reached out to John immediately and it was like, Hey John, can we just, can we just cut this portion out of it? You know? And he was, he was more than happy to do it. It's not an issue of it being cut out. It's more about just remembering it. Um, yeah. So I was just curious because I remember somebody telling me about this before and I'm like, wait a minute, how does that actually work? Cause once the videos are made, I don't see them anymore. And, but I do know you're right. He does seem to review them all because I've noticed him make comments in the uh, chats, like about different things he had noticed. Like, oh, you know, if you, not bad things, I'm just saying like, oh, you mentioned something about this R function. Here's a place to go look. And, you know, so he, yeah. he must spend a lot of time watching those things. <laughs> Poor guy. I, I think I think he bumps them up to two times. Like, I think he bumps ah. them up two times. I, I also make sure to, you know, cause I'm a facilitator. I also try and make sure to like make note of anything. Like I said, it never really happens. Oh, okay. It's just more, it's more for people to kind of know, you know, like these are community driven, they're community open. So it's just good to know that like, we want to share this with the community. So just know that if you do have like, you know, stuff that you can't share or shouldn't share, if you're screen sharing, just, you know, just know that they're being recorded basically. So did that answer your question, Ron? Yes, it did. Thank you so much. Okay, awesome. Oh, um, yeah. great. So the other thing is, is that camera is optional, but encouraged. I mean, it's it's up to you. Obviously, we want to respect your privacy, um, you know, or, you know, obviously, if there's just people listening in. But, you know, it's just good to have that discussion with people on it. So if you can share, open up your camera, that's great. If not, you know, obviously, want to respect your privacy and your, 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 uh, your comfort during the sessions. Big one that I emphasize with any book club that I facilitate, is if we need to slow down and discuss, just let the speaker or myself know. Um, you're not going to hurt my feelings if you stop me mid-sentence and you want to discuss something. Like, I am completely cool with that. And so I think a lot more is learned from discussion. And I think most likely if somebody has, if somebody has the same, if somebody has a question, more than likely someone else has that same question. So don't be afraid to, um, you know, ask those questions. And then the other thing is we're all here to learn. So um, this is meant to be a learning space. So don't be afraid to ask any questions that you might have because um, like I said, this is just a situation for us all to learn. So that's, a, that's how the meetings are gonna be run. What's the pace gonna look like? We're gonna try to cover one chapter a week, but if we have to, we can split chapters up when we feel like it's too much. Uh, I know when I facilitated the R packages book, there was, there was the section on testing that got split over three, three sessions. Like it just was too much. It was just too many things and too many new components that it was just like, we have to spread this out over multiple things. So if you're interested in a specific topic area, I'll work with you as the facilitator to say, Hey, are you willing to like, are, are you able to cover this in one session? If not, do we need to break it apart? And I'll leave that up for the group to decide. So basically um, the pace will be one chapter a week, unless we feel as a group, there's just no way to cover all that material. Uh, obviously, for here here in North America, or here here in North America, we're going to have some holidays that are going to be coming up. You know, holiday season's just around the corner, so we'll be skipping some some meeting times around that time. Obviously, I'll work with the group to make sure, like, hey, this is getting close to Thanksgiving, or hey, this is getting close to Christmas. Do we want to meet this week? If not let's just push the schedule forward. So we're definitely going to make sure that if something falls on a holiday, I'll let the group decide if it's something you want to decide. And 
I know people's travel plans get, you know, moved around and stuff. So I want to work with you. If somebody's watching this later and they join or somebody here is international, um, I, I apologize for my ignorance and all the world holidays that are potentially there. If there is something that you feel is going to be a conflict with this, just let me know and I'll, I'll work with the group to see if it's going to affect a majority of people and if we need to like push it forward or not. So um, just, yeah, just communicate with me if you have any questions about holidays or if we should skip things. My biggest thing for the pace is I will keep every session to an hour, uh, exactly an hour. I do this for a couple of reasons. Um, the first reason is I want to respect everybody's time. Like I understand that everybody's busy and everybody has things outside of this, whether that be work or personal life or family life or whatever it may be. Uh, I want to keep this on the schedule for an hour. And I don't think it's fair if it gets pushed off into like an hour 15, hour 30, and somebody has to jump off and miss a piece of the discussion. So I will be pretty strict about the hour. It's very rare that I'll let us go over the hour. So if we have to push material being cut off on that hour, we'll just push it to the next session. But I, yeah, I just, it's a big thing that I respect other people's time and I want everybody to be able to join in and know that this hour is the block of hour that we're gonna use for the, for the session. And then the last thing that I wanna talk about pace is the way that I kind of like to run and facilitate is I encourage the group to adopt a go no matter what mentality. So um, I found that looking at looking through some of the other book clubs sometimes what happens is some book clubs kind of go stale and sometimes things get pushed back and they get pushed back and they get pushed back and then some of the book clubs you know kind of drop off and they don't get finished uh, i am a big proponent that if i'm going to commit to this i'm going to push to get it done and work every single week and i'm going to make that promise to this group that i'm going to take a go no matter what mentality so that means that if if you've only gotten a certain amount of chapter done, that's fine. Cause I, I know things happen. There's probably going to be a week or two where I'm going to be like, oh shoot, I only got half this chapter done or something like that. If that happens, it's just a matter of communication and to just cover what we have so far. Um, uh, the other thing is, is that as the facilitator, if somebody volunteers for a specific time, what I will do is about uh, maybe three or four days beforehand, if you signed up for a session, I will reach out to you through the Slack. Uh, I'll just direct message you and say, hey, how's it going? Like, do you think you're gonna be able to meet the deadline for this week? Um, if I ask you that question, just be honest with me because if, if you're not able to do it, that's totally fine, just let me know. Because if I do it three to four days beforehand, at least I could ask you if you want me, if you feel like you have too much going on, I can at least pick up pick up that that chapter for that week. And so like, if I reach out to you those three to four days, just be honest with me and be like, hey, Colin, I don't know if I'm gonna make it. And I'll be like, okay, great. Do you want me to take it? Cause I gladly will. So, but yeah, that's a big thing is I just don't want the book club to go stale and I wanna get through this book and I wanna make sure that I motivate the group to do it. And so I just encourage everybody to kind of adopt that go no matter what mentality, so. This is a, a great place to take a break, but what questions do people have about how the book club's gonna be facilitated or kind of like the general pace of how this will run? No, well, that sounds like pretty much what we did later on in terms of like, you know, most of the time we got through a chapter, but we were yeah. really, really definitely split it up, so. Yeah, we mostly just press. Like, I like this. I didn't never made that point clear, though. That's a good thing I would take away for future book clubs too. The idea of the go, no matter what uh, philosophy, because you're right. It's pretty easy to like skip a week. We we skipped a week here and there, and I know in the Bayes Rule Book Club, um, but we try not to for sure. Yeah, it's just one of those things where it's just like it, you know, and, and I get it, you know, life gets busy. And I remember, I think the last book club I facilitated, there was a time where I was just like, there's too much going on at work. There's too much going on. Can we skip this week? Um, so that's not an issue. But if it becomes one of those things where it's like three, four weeks of not doing anything and then it's like gets lost, I feel bad because it's, you know, I made the commitment to facilitate it. So I want to make sure my role is to push the group forward. So, yeah, I Excellent. like that plan. Yeah, excellent. So I also let's, think, um, I, also oh, think that, I was just going to say, like, I think, you know, the fact that, um, well, I mean, I don't know, I, I should, maybe I shouldn't say, this is my hunch, is, you know, we, uh, Ron and I are doing this more heavily conceptual 
Bayesian book, you know, which obviously there's a lot of new stuff, but I, I feel like for the um, advanced R stuff, there's a lot of opportunities for us to like, you know, do examples on our own, like, you know, on, on our, in our own R session. So I think that would be a good thing to try. Anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's like, true. Absolutely. Yeah, Ron, uh, you can add to that? No, I was just agreeing. <laughs> I like that idea. I haven't actually looked too far into the books, but from what I have seen, it does seem like that's there will be opportunities for that. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So I've, I've done enough talking for myself. I kind of want to do a couple of introductions here. Because I think one power of this of these meetings is, is that we get to meet other people and other professionals. And so I'll do a kind of brief introduction of myself, but um, here are some of the questions that I have for you is, um, who are you? You know, just kind of give me a basic rundown of who you are and your background. Uh, if you feel comfortable uh, sharing, you know, where are you calling from? Uh, and if you don't feel comfortable with that, that's fine. You can skip that question. Um, how long have you been using R? And then like, what was your introduction to R? So kind of hearing people's background on their story of how they got introduced to R and how they started using it, I think is kind of interesting. And then what are you looking more forward to during the group? And so um, while I'm kind of doing an introduction of myself, if you want to think about those questions that um, be more than happy to answer after I kind of give my introduction. So, uh, so hi, I'm Colin. <laughs> this picture is obviously old. It's, it's an older picture of me. But um, basically, I am a media research analyst and data enthusiast. Uh, I am not a data scientist. Uh, I am a data analyst who uses R. Uh, most of the work that I do professionally is focused on uh, audience and media and marketing research. Uh, I do spend a lot of time focusing on wrangling and communicating data. So a little bit of modeling, but not as much as a data scientist would do. So I do not do a lot of modeling, but I do a lot of the um, data cleaning and visualization and stuff surrounding that way. Uh, I also adjunct university courses. Uh, I teach um, I teach a data analysis course. Um, I also teach some other communications-based courses as well. And then some of the tools that I use is R. I use a lot of SQL, a little bit of Bash, and I usually work within the Google Cloud platform. And I'm also learning a couple other things as well. But um, some other questions that I had here, uh, lost my notes is where am I calling from? So I'm currently located in Lincoln, Nebraska. So the middle of the country, uh, Midwest. And then, so how long have I been using R? Uh, I would say I'm probably close to at least nine or 10 years. Uh, my first couple of years, I was kind of on and off. And then probably the past, ooh, I would say seven or eight years is when I've really started to deep dive into using R for all of my workflows. What was my introduction to R? Uh, basically, I was a person that was using SPSS, dabbled in a little bit of SAS, and then one day at work, I just decided, I'm tired of using these programs. I hear this really neat kind of community called R or this community that uses R and likes R and teaches R. And so I was like, I'm just going to deep dive into it. I'm going to start using it. And so that was probably about seven, eight years ago. Um, and then I just dived in it and never stopped working in it. And then what am I looking most forward to this group? Um, I think I'm at a point in my R development that I want to know how it works. And I want to know how it works more in depth. And so, you know, I have the wrangling down. I have the visualization stuff down. I have package development down and documentation. But I really want to get to know the language so I can become a better programmer in the, using R. And so I'm really excited to read through this book and learn from other people and kind of gain from their experience. So. So that was a little introduction of myself. Um, does anybody else want to share? Um, yeah, I'll go. Uh, unless Ron, you wanted to. No, you go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, uh, I'll come in after you. Yeah, um, I'm Ryan Hanna Michael. I'm, um, I, I have somewhat similar, although I'm a lot older than you, I guess. Um, I, I've had somewhat similar background in terms of like, you know, I started on SPSS and in the 90s, you know, when it was a lot less. Uh, um, fun to use uh, SPSS. Um, actually, maybe it's probably too much. Um, but um, yeah, how I, I I basically well, first of all, let me just say I work for um, Oracle um, um, Health. I, I do a lot of bio, I do biostatistics. Um, I've worked you know in a lot of observational research and um, digital therapeutics and stuff like that. So I would say um, my background is mostly 
um, related to just um, health, health and medical kind of you know, questions. Um, but uh, I totally like lost my train of thought. Um, oh yeah, so I, I actually went to a summer institute at uh, Michigan, University of Michigan, like in 2014, and I was you know an SPSS user and uh, pretty happy. I guess I, I didn't really know what else was out there, but yeah, there was a um, a class on how to use R, and I um, some people were showing you know, stuff. Uh, this is before the tidyverse and whatnot, but you know, I mean, people were doing like these amazing things in like ggplot, and, and even back then, you know, 2014, and so that was just like kind of hooked me. But like you, it, it took me a while to kind of get up and running. I think yeah, you you really have to just decide to just do, use it all the time. And, it sucks. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? I think a lot of people just avoid that. And then the, 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 the honeymoon phase or the, or the awkward phase goes a lot longer than it should. But anyway, I'm rambling, but yeah, I, um, like you, I, you know, I would like to be able to, I mean, I, I do quite a bit of modeling. I do quite a bit of munging and data cleaning, like you, like you mentioned and visualizing, but you know, eventually I'd like to create like some internal packages for work for things that we do that are, fairly consistent and you know, homogeneous in terms of um, but just the more I can learn about um, you know what's under the hood I guess that, that would be something I'm pretty stoked about. Yeah. Appreciate it. that Ryan. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for sharing them. So uh, Ron you want to you want to share a little bit about yourself? Yeah I am a uh, well I was <laughs> I was in mostly working in academia and then I worked in industry for a while doing um, basically applying the data analysis skills I learned as a physicist uh, at uh, doing my work there uh, in industry with at MIT Lincoln Laboratory, which is a uh, federally funded research development uh, center. And I did a lot of just random what they called systems analysis back then. I don't know what it's called now, but, <laughs> um, you know, take a problem try to apply some kind of data analysis tools to it, to some data that you have, or just sometimes just modeling with nothing or very little data, uh, just to try to understand various systems and explain it to uh, stakeholders. Um, I did that for quite a number of years. And then I started working for a small, uh, actually my dad's company, uh, a dietary supplement company. I worked with him, with him for a little while as he was closing the company down, he just needed some help at that point. So that turned into like a five year stint doing that before we finally did close the company down um, recently. And I did apply a lot of these kind of data analysis tools there too, to now to sales numbers, customer churn, and this kind of thing, uh, survival analysis, although I didn't quite know how to do that then. I kind of did it my own way, but anyway. <laughs> so uh, right now I'm kind of in between things. So I'm just trying to sharpen my tools up and, and try, I want to start doing my own kind of uh freelance or consulting uh in data analysis uh, primarily um machine learning maybe somewhat but that's more like buzzword bingo at this point but <laughs> everything's machine learning but <laughs> so that's where i'm at from that point of view um uh, where i'm calling from i'm in arizona phoenix arizona phoenix arizona well scottsdale actually and um i've been using r I would say on and off for about maybe five years, but my level of R understanding has always been very shallow. It's kind of like cut and paste code. Um, I've, the reason I started learning R in the first place is just because I was starting to learn more and more statistical methods. My, my data analysis before that has been more like from a scientific point of view. And when I started doing more statistical things and more soci uh, sociology, I guess, I don't know, more softer <laughs> things, that uh, I needed some more tools. And it turns out, I mean, you're aware of this, I'm sure, but most of the material out there for learning these kind of things uses R. So if you want to learn these things, you better learn some, at least some R in order to understand it. Like one of the first things, one of the first books I used was this book called Doing Bayesian Data Analysis, and that uses R as well. And I kind of went through that book relatively quickly, and I'm still learning, as Ryan knows, we're still learning more and more Bayesian methods as time goes on. So we're trying to develop a better understanding of that particular methodology, but also trying to learn all the other tools that are out there, trees or uh, support vector machines, whatever, all these different tools are very useful in different contexts. And again, all the material is using R for the most part. 
Now, my own tools that I use much more commonly is Python and as well as Mathematica, which is a, I use Mathematica a lot when I was a, doing physics and also working at MIT Lincoln Laboratory because I could afford the licenses because somebody else was paying for it. But I slowly started transitioning myself over to a, a lot more Python. And now I'm trying to add R to that tool set. There's other tools I use, C++ often as well uh, for doing numerical analysis. Uh, SQL, like you mentioned SQL, I use SQL an awful lot at, uh, uh, for pulling customer data and everything else out of the, the company's database, which was, if you know anything about SQL, I'll tell you one thing, this database was a nightmare. It wasn't normalized, orthogonal, any way at all. Uh, so what I'm hoping to get from this group is to really understand, I mean, right now, like I said, my level of our understanding is pretty shallow. I sometimes, you know, have to cut, not sometimes, I shouldn't say that, often, almost always, cut and paste things out of the help or out of, the, out of Google somewhere, like, how do I do this again? Okay, here we go, great. And so, although I can muddle around uh, with R, I really don't understand what it's doing a lot of times, especially from a, somebody coming from a more... Uh, I, I learn. I know a lot of programming languages. I know kind of how they work. But when I do things as R, a lot of things seem mysterious. And I think, you know, like, what the heck? How does it know which methods? Now I'm starting to learn more about the about the object system. Um, but now I want to really learn that in, de in more depth. But uh, now I'm rambling. But the point is, like, how does it know which plot method to use? How does it know which things going on? How does any of this work? So, and why is it sometimes things seem mutable and sometimes they're not mutable? And what you know what? It all seems rather mysterious, and I don't like that. It's something I like to know how things work, so I want to dig in a little deeper. So it's kind of weird. It's like it's called an advanced R book, but I read the preference, and it really is intended, I think, a lot of ways. It's, I'm like a perfect audience for that because it's somebody who knows other programming languages and is coming to R from the point of view of a computer scientist, so to speak, um, and trying to understand the language because most of the books that teach R, they just, okay, here's how you do this, and here's how you do that. And here, I'm like, well, how does it know? How does it know how to, what, what I'm trying to do here? Right. So anyway, that's kind of my rambling introduction. By the way, I, I'm, I'm in Cleveland. Uh, I, I forgot to mention that. So we're all not too far from this. Well, I mean, relatively speaking. Hey, I appreciate that. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Ron, and, and thanks, Ryan, for sharing it. Like I said, it, it's great to hear everybody's kind of origin story. And just hearing from both of you, it sounds like you, both of you have uh, extensive experience you know, in different areas and, and within using R. And so I'm excited to, to work with both of you and, and to learn from each of you because I think I'm probably going to learn a lot more than, than you will ever learn from me. So I appreciate you spending the time here. Um, so those are our group introductions. So I, I don't want to spend too much time talking about Git and GitHub because it sounds like some of you are already familiar with it. So, and there's just so many different flavors of how you use Git and use GitHub. And I made the fool's errand when I was teaching uh, when I when I led facilitated another group, probably well, my second one, I was like, I'm just going to tell everybody how to do Git one certain way. And I learned really, really quickly that there are many different ways to do it. And there's no one size fits all to use or interface with this tool. And so basically, I'm just going to pass along some different like tools that you might use. Um, if you are unfamiliar with it or if you need some different um, some help with this, and you want to stay in the R environment, I highly suggest looking at the use this package. The use this package has some great uh, utility functions and they have two vignettes in the article sections that will talk more about how to basically use these functions within the use this package to manage your GitHub credentials and to manage pull requests. So basically what you're going to do is if you want to facilitate, I we highly suggest that you add to these materials in the GitHub repo. And so um, what we ask people to do is while using these, um, obviously what you'll do is you're going to fork the repo into your own side of, of GitHub and then just create a branch with some informative name so we know what materials are being updated or what changes you're making to those materials. And then you'll submit that pull request directly into the repo for the book. And then those PRs will go through an automatic testing to make sure everything's good to go. And then they'll be manually reviewed by John. John Harmon, who manages the groups, and he'll he'll merge the pull requests or accept the changes to that. So um, just keep it just keep uh, up to date with that. But talking with both of you, it seems like most of you might have experience in GitHub. But here are some other materials for you if you want to get some more um, specifics about it. If you do need help, um, you know definitely reach out to the community through the Slack group. Uh, John the Geek is really responsive. 
So don't be afraid to ask him a question on how he wants something to be managed within a repo, or you can reach out to me and I'll try and help you as best I can um, to help with the different conventions that we have. They're not really strict on how certain things should happen, but if you just have a question, just reach out and then we can figure it out. So um, what questions can I answer for people about using Git and GitHub for this group? Do both of you use um, GitHub? Oh yeah. I, I, I'm not as savvy with it in terms of like, I, I really want to do like version control in my work, but for, for some reason, for like, you know, security reasons, proprietary reasons, I can't always do it, but I certainly can go on GitHub and like, you know, do basic stuff. Like if I need to get something off of it, but I'm not a, I am not an expert on that for sure. Okay, good. That's, that's good to know. So um, I'll give you, I'll pass along some resources resource for you. And actually the facilitating the book clubs were, was where I learned how to use Git and GitHub. And so um, especially version control, and I'm not going to say I am an expert by any means, but I have definitely practicing and using it with the book club has gotten me better for it. And so my next slide, I got some resources for you to help you out here. So okay. if you do have some additional questions that you might want to use to learn how to use this, the first thing that I want to say is, is like, there are just a ton of tools. Uh, I think I just run across a new tool to interface with Git as Git for version control and GitHub. So if you feel like you're searching for this stuff and you get overwhelmed with the, with it, just understand there's just a ton of tools. Like, and I've changed my workflow a ton of times. So if, if you just want to stay in like the R environment, I highly suggest just go to the use this package and read these two vignettes, managing your GitHub credentials and the pull request helpers does a great job explaining how this process all works. And it makes it so simple to set this all up and to make like simple PRs or to make simple commits, pushes and PRs, really simple. If you're somebody who wants to dive in and learn a little bit more, uh, Jenny Bryan has wrote a let's uh, a happy Git and GitHub for use R. This has several chapters, a whole book on how to use Git and GitHub in R. I have not read all of this, um, but I've definitely read different chapters on how to do certain things and I'll reference it back and forth. So if you wanna dive deeper, this is a great place, especially if you're somebody coming from R. Um, Talked about use this. If you want to get go way down the rabbit hole, uh, Git has documentation and it has a reference manual. Uh, I will highly suggest not reading this page for page because it's a lot. Um, but if you are somebody that needs like a very detailed explanation, there is a reference manual of how to use Git for version control. And I guess I'm kind of muddying, muddying up these two concepts. Git is a specific like program that you use for, for version control and GitHub, and I'm explaining it in very simplified terms, it's just a way to host Git and, and Git for version control. So if if I get this mixed up, just know that these two things are different, but they're connected in some way. So, um, and then I also did some, I did an introduction for M Shiny. There's a video here if you're interested in looking at that. And then the book clubs also did like a YouTube playlist for different ways to use Git. But again, it's just one of those things where we've had conversations in the community, how to get people up and running with it. But it's just like, there's so many flavors. There's so many clients. It's just hard to say, like, just follow this one workflow to use it. And so you just have to kind of play around with it and get used to it and choose your own workflow to do it. So, but these are some great resources to help you get up and started. And if you have questions, just reach out. Like, I will be happy to even do like a one-on-one -on -one Zoom to be like, this is how I do it these are some of the concepts and stuff so did that, did that help you out ryan yeah no i'll be I'll, I'll yeah i'll be fine i mean i've done stuff with you know with kid it's just not it's not something i do super regular but i'll be i'll be fine okay cool yeah just like i said any help just let me know i i guess i'm also curious too from the group um what types of ids do you guys use do do you use mostly our studio or do you use like other ids outside of our studio Purely our studio for me. Our studio, okay. Ron, how about yourself? Uh, for R, I de definitely just use R Studio. For Python, I use Visual Studio Code. Um, okay, cool. X cool. Code yeah. for my C plus plus stuff. So okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Because I, 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 I generally use Git. I 
Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. I was going to say, I also tend to use uh, Git Kraken for my Git stuff just because I like that tool a lot. It's pretty easy to get things done in there and see you get a good, good graphical view of your uh, repo and everything. Cool. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll mostly, if I share examples and stuff, I'll mostly use our studio. For the past like six great. to eight months, for the past six to eight months, I've been moving over to um, uh, IDE called NeoVim, but um, just for the groups that we're all kind of on the same page, I will just strictly use, I will strictly use uh, our studio so I don't muddy up the waters with IDEs and stuff like that. So. NeoVim, that sounds interesting. That's not, it sounds like it has Vim on the end of it, which is something I used to use a lot. So, oh. I, I, it's it's a it's a topic for another time, but like I've made the transition okay, cool. over the yeah. If you want to talk about it later, like it's I I'm just yeah. I've been doing it for about six to I switched my workflow six to eight months and it's been awesome. But I know oh, the community okay, uses cool. I use the community uses our studio, so I don't want to muddy up the water. So I will mostly use our studio for demonstrations and stuff. Yeah, so. cool. Okay, cool. Um, we're going to kind of jump over and talk a little bit about like the introduction here and what was kind of covered in the introduction. Most of the stuff is the preface stuff. Um, so if you haven't read it, that's fine. It's really, really short. But really, um, one thing that we want to talk about are what are some of the learning objectives? What are we going to get out of this book? And these are kind of the learning objectives that I've identified, at least just skimming through the book and the materials that are available. But the first one is like improving our programming skills. So that's the first one being able to develop a deep understanding of the R language fundamentals. So really understanding how works, how R works at a fundamental level. Being able to understand functional programming and what that means in the context of R. Being able to understand object programming as it's applied to R. And then the other concept of understanding metaprogramming while developing in R. And so um, I'm really interested in the final two, uh, the object oriented portion of it and the metaprogramming portion of it. I feel like I have a pretty good hand of functional programming in R, but the two that I'm really, really interested to expand my development skills is object-oriented and metaprogramming. Um, some other things that we want to mention as well is, is that for this chapter, it's recognizing the differences between the first and second edition of this book. Um, and then also it describes like kind of the overall structure of the book. And then it gives you like some, some background information to decide whether this book is right for you. Now, these links were left over from the previous cohort. Um, I have not dug into them, but here are some additional book suggestions if you find these topics very interesting. Um, I haven't done a vetting on them, but if you're interested in additional resources that are similar to this or talk about some of these like broader topics in, in the form of like programming, take a look at these. So I've read two out of three of those books, so I feel like I'm in the right spot. <laughs> uh, Anything you want to add about them? Because I, I have not vetted them. I, uh, I've read the uh, Structure Interpretation of Computer Programming. Uh, it's a great, fantastic book. I highly recommend it. Um, it just really is a mind-expanding book about how uh, computers work and how programs work. Um, and I've read the Pragmatic Program, which is, you know, pretty decent, but not in the same, not really in the same class as a SICK. But I have not read Concepts, Techniques, and Models of Computer Programming, though. I'll have to add that to my list. Awesome. Yeah. And again, I think it goes back to the idea of like this, this book is not focused on data analysis. It's focused on R as a programming language. And so it's really focused on developing your programming skills. And so I think that's where these books come into play is like talking about those larger, yeah. like how computers work and how you program and some of like the best practices to being a better, pro being a better programmer. I've actually, now that you mentioned it, I've heard of the pragmatic programmer. I've just never read it. Um, I think it comes from like the the field of like software carpentry, doesn't it? Or kind of that area. Yeah. 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 So like if you get into like the software carpentry stuff, they'll mention the pragmatic programmer. So it comes from that kind of line of thought. Um, okay, cool. Um, so what's new? Basically, there's just a quip in here. It's the first edition used base R functions almost exclusively. Uh, this version expands expands its more advanced functions provided by other packages. So if you're not familiar with R or some of the different uh, different approaches to using R, there's obviously base R and then there's, well, I shouldn't say obviously, there's base R and then there's the tidyverse style. Um, those are two different styles um, that are out there. Um, I have no affinity towards either. I think they're a tool that you want to use whenever you want to use it or use the one that's most comfortable for you. 
Um, but just know that this one is going to be more focused on expanding it into advanced functions that are provided by other packages. Uh, what about both of you? Do you do most of you use base R or do you use tidyverse or you just use whatever is the best? Um, or not the best, but whatever is most useful. I, I would say I'd probably use tidyverse stuff for like 90 of what I do. I mean, there's obviously some things that pop up where I work code in base, but my needs are well met by the tidyverse. Sweet. Sure. How about you, Ron? Uh, I did a lot of stuff earlier on and with base R and now I'm, now I'm just starting to learn more and more about the tidyverse, especially in this base rule book because it uses a lot of the tidyverse functions. Yeah, and, and both styles are both, you know, are, you know, both approachable. So I, I highly suggest using either. I'm just, I come from more of a tidyverse. That's how, that was my introduction to it. And that's where I feel most comfortable, but just uh, know the book kind of gets away a little bit more from base R and just moves to different functions that are available in different packages. Um, and so another kind of quote from this is, it's a use of new packages, particularly Rlang, which provides a clean interface to low level data structures and operations. And I'll be honest, I haven't used Rlang yet, but just know that's a R package that allows you to get down to those lower level data structures. I wish I could expand on that some more. Um, I just don't know enough about Rlang to um, express it. So, but I'm sure we're going to get to it in the book. So, <laughs> so let's, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, oh I was just excellent. scratching. Sorry. No question. <laughs> no, you're good. Um, so here's kind of the, the, the general structure of the book and we've already talked about this. And so I'm just going to highlight it real quick. We're going to start at the foundational level and the foundational looking at data types, um, looking at how those data types um, or how we can use those different data types and some of the behaviors of those data types. And then we'll start working into larger data structures as we work through it. So that's like the first section. The next section is going to be based on functional programming. So making function or so um, goes into how we program in R and how we create functions and describing some like um, more useful things like function factories and operators. And then we get into R's OOP system, which we'll start talking about S3, S4, R6. And I think maybe the new R7 version of it um, maybe, I think, but I think it'll be a heavy discussion about R6 and these different OOP uh, types of systems that you can apply object-oriented programming. Uh, then there's going to be metaprogramming. Um, I'm not as familiar with metaprogramming. This is something that's new to me, but we're going to be introduced to that topic, and then we're going to talk about different techniques um, to help us, like, debug and to improve performance. So I'm sorry. AirPods just died, so I got to go hardwired here. Sorry. Oh, I've been on meetings all day, so got to go with the old tried and true plugged in method now. Um, I think this is a big thing to know, especially uh, for people that are maybe thinking about, is this book right for me? And I want to be upfront about what this book is and what information is in it. In it. Uh, this book is about R as a programming language. This book is not R as a data analysis tool. So if you're coming at this saying like, oh, I'm interested in like data wrangling, I'm interested in data modeling, I'm interested in creating visualizations, this is not the book for you. This is not the book club for you. Now, I don't say that to discourage people from joining in because I want as many people to be here, but just know if you're coming in it thinking that this is going to be about data science, uh, that's not what this book is. If you are interested in those topics, I highly, highly suggest looking at R for data science. Um, there are book clubs for this, but this is a really good introduction to the tidyverse style of data analysis and data science. And I highly suggest looking at this book and, and being a part of that group if you're interested in more of like the R as a data analysis tool. So, um, and then the other thing that I do want to say, again, I don't want to discourage anybody because I want everybody to be welcome to this group, but just know that some experience using R will be helpful. You know, and so um, if you've used R in the past and you have some experience, this is a great book for you. So here's the organization of Book Visualize. This was kind of held over from the previous group, but this is where we're going to start. I've already talked about it, that we're going to go to foundations, functional programming, object-oriented programming, metaprogramming, and different techniques. This is the structure breakdown for foundations. Um, just for the sake of time, I don't think I need to talk about these because we'll get to them. But here are some of the general topics to which we will get at with foundations. 
And then within functional programming, these are the different topics that we'll talk about, working starting with the broad topic, functional programming, going into functionals, then talking about function faction, our function factories and function operators. Then we have our OOP systems, which we'll start talking about base types and how those base types build into um, data structures that allow us to do OOP. So S4, R6, and S3, maybe R7. And then we'll talk about the trade-offs of using object-oriented programming in the context of R development. And then these some of these metaprogramming stuff, talking about the big picture, valuation, quasi-quotation expressions. I'm interested in this because I think this is something that's very black box to me when I program in R. It's very, very black box. So it's going to be good that there's a few chapters on that. And then some um, techniques, especially techniques to debug, uh, measuring performance, improving performance. And if you want to extend R into other programming languages like C++. Um, so if you have interest in that, um, we'll definitely get to that. Um, so I know, Ron, you mentioned that you were interested in like C++ and or you had some experience in C++, right? Yeah, I used it quite a bit, actually. Okay, that's that's good because uh, I have no experience in it. So the, this might be a great section for you to, to help out with. Um, sure, so yeah. um, I had some interest in maybe learning Rust, but I just don't know if it's directly applicable to my work. So, but I think that might be a little bit further than I need to go. But I think this kind of extension into other programming languages and its relationship to R is going to be a really, really interesting discussion. So does anybody have any questions about... Um, how the book is structured or things that we're going to cover or not cover anything I can answer for anybody. Nope. Seems clear. Okay, cool. So here's some additional resources for you that were mentioned. Uh, there is a first edition of the book. Uh, really the first edition of the book really focused on like some base R equivalents. So if you're somebody who is interested in learning some of these base R stuff, I highly suggest checking out the first, oh, that's the R for DS. So here's the first edition. It's still available for you. Um, no, there might be some outdated stuff within this book, but if you're still interested in some of those kind of base R kind of conventions and stuff, definitely check out the first edition of the book. I think when I first started to try and read this, I think I was reading the first edition, which was like five years ago, and I wasn't ready to do it. So um but if you are somebody that needs to know more information about it, here it is. Um, and then, so the book is also going to have some exercises in it. Um, I highly suggest doing the exercises. Um, uh, some exercises you may not necessarily be um, able to answer. So if you need the solutions, there's an advanced R solutions where um, people have gone through the chapters and have created solutions for them. Um, you know, I going during our discussions, I asked that people do the exercises and share how they went and solved them. But if you're struggling with them, there are definitely there's a solutions book for you and you can access them and uh, to learn more. But I highly suggest everybody in the book clubs that I facilitate is really try to solve it because it's going to make you a better programmer because um, part of programming is solving problems. And so if you kind of get that first initial shock of like, shoot, I have a problem, how do I solve it? That's going to make you a better programmer because you're going to go, you're going to develop your problem solving skills in the context of our programming. And so don't just jump right into the solutions, really, really try first. And then if you get really stuck, look at the solutions guide. So those are resources. Uh, I think that's pretty much everything about how the session is going to run. The last section that I have is, oh, I'll cover two last things before I open it up for any other questions because we're getting close to the hour here. Um, all the recordings from the previous sessions and cohorts are available. So we are cohort number seven. So there have been six cohorts before us. So this information has been covered. Uh, so these are great resources. If you have a specific chapter that you want to cover, jump into these previous videos and maybe watch some of them um, because again just different perspectives and different approaches of how to solve it or how to approach this material those stuff are available to you the last thing that i do want to cover is how do you sign up so i'm going to it's going to be in your slack channel here 
So basically what you're going to do is if you do want to sign up for a time, it is linked and it's book or it's pinned on top of the channel. So if you do want to volunteer to present, just go to volunteer to present, click down, click on cohort number seven, and then it will take you to the sign up sheet or where you want to go. So um, if you're interested, just sign up. Um, you know, I'll be looking for volunteers for uh, obviously 1114. I'll cover the rest of chapter one, the introductions on 1107. Obviously, keep in mind, we won't meet next week, but we'll skip. But I'll if you chapter two, I'm, I'm, I'm writing my name down for that right now. Oh, sweet. Yeah, just fill them in. Yeah, just fill them in wherever you feel. Um, and like I said, if any of these aren't taken, um, you know, I'll reach out and see if anybody wants to take them. If not, they'll just default to me. And don't worry if you can't do it. Like, I'm totally cool with like taking on because I like facilitating. So, um, and the other thing that I want to encourage, um, both of you have been a part of this group before, but people that are watching later on, like sign up for topics. Like, even if you have no interest in them, like teaching a topic is a great way to learn it. And so I highly, highly suggest facilitating and I highly encourage anybody to sign up for these topics because you will learn so much more if you teach it than just passively listening to somebody else try and demonstrate it or show it. So um, even if you're concerned about a specific thing, like I know R6 pretty well, but I do I know nothing about S3 or S4. So I'm probably going to sign up for one of those because uh, I need to learn them. But um, yeah, I highly suggest if you see a topic, sign up for it. So projecting out, if everything works perfect, will be done. What is this, May? Yep, January, February, March, April, May. May 8th. But more likely than not, some of these will spread over multiple weeks. So we'll probably be around May or June before we get through all this material. So if you're looking at for like time commitment and forecasting of how long this book will take, it's looking like we'll get into, we'll probably be into June before we get done. So, so with that, that's pretty much all the information I have for um, how the book club will run. I guess I'll open it up here for the last five minutes. What questions do people have about um, how we'll run this book club? Excited. No, no questions. Just excited to, to get going. Yeah, that list of the chapters looks really interesting to me. So I'm looking forward to to going through those things. Yeah, I'm really I'm really interested, uh, especially with, with you, Ron, with your computer science background. Um, getting into some of these more programming stuff, I think it's going to be interesting for you to kind of get your perspective on this, especially with OOP, because I'm I. I'm still trying to wrap my mind around OOP and stuff. And so, and then Ryan, I think with your background and some of the data analysis uh, modeling stuff, I think getting some of your more practical experience, I think will be helpful in kind of learning that as well. So yeah, I'm, I'm super excited about this. Like I said, one of the best things about these groups is that you get to meet some really cool people and some people that have a lot of experience and you just, you learn a ton. So I'm excited yeah. about that. Yeah. So two weeks from today, we're, we're doing chapter one. Yeah, we'll finish yep. the rest of chapter one. Yep. Um, yeah, and again, it's because of that time shift. Um, I got to jump. I got to, sorry, I, sorry, as Ron will tell you, I am always got some other meeting, and so I'm getting a call from my from my father now, so I got to jump off. But um, I will right. see you in two weeks. Ron, I, I, have a, I have a reputation to uphold. I get it. <laughs> I was wondering. I was waiting for that. Two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, it was great meeting you, Ryan. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Great meeting you. Call in and we'll see you in two weeks. Yeah. No questions yeah. from me either. All right. Cool. Good job yeah. on the introduction. Yeah. I appreciate, appreciate it. Appreciate that. Yeah. I'm excited about this and I'm ready to start digging into it. So, yeah. So I'll see you next week. If you have any questions, just okay. reach out over Slack. If not, I'll see you on just the fourth or the seventh. Is the fourth? Uh, on the seventh. So I'll see you on the seventh. Seventh. Very good. All right, have All a right, happy we'll talk to you later. <laughs> yeah. Bye. We'll see you later. Bye.